Say.
just with me now. We have a lot to thank the Lord for. If you're turning your Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31, the title of the message this morning is The Bottom Line. The Bottom Line. And I know you were just standing, but if you would stand one more time <clears throat> as we read these verses. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard him, 
heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Father, we thank you today for this word. And we recognize that as we look at this and we may think this is so simple, it is also very profound and it's also very difficult sometimes to live out unless we are allowing your spirit to work in our lives. And so I pray, Father, that we will be filled with your spirit and that we will seek to remember this every day, that we need to love you and we need to love others. And that's the bottom line. So help us today, Father, as we go through this text together, that we might hear something, we might pick up something that would stick in our heart and in our brain and that we would leave here with a resolve to want to focus on this in the days to come. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you had a serious question, a matter maybe even of life and death, would you want a straight answer or would you want to go to somebody who gave you a long philosophical discourse that sounded real nice and good and pretty, but it really didn't answer your question? Well, I think I know the answer to that because most of us don't want you to beat around the bush, just cut to the chase, just get to the bottom line, just give me the facts, just get to the point. A man came to Jesus that way, and it's in this passage of Scripture. He came with a very important question. The Bible doesn't tell us all of his circumstances. It doesn't tell us why he asked the question, but it was a very serious question. It was a very good question. It was an important question. As the man approached Jesus, there were a group of Pharisees, or it was a group of Pharisees, and they were seeking to debate, to debate with Jesus. And the man must have realized that Jesus was a brilliant teacher just by listening to him, and he went right to the heart of the matter. Now, as the man asked Jesus this question, he's not trying to be argumentative. He's not being antagonistic. And that's interesting because up until this time, from chapter 11, verse 27, to chapter 12, verse 27, there are three hostile challenges in the ways of questions from the religious leaders. He appears to be humble and sincere when he asked the question, which is the first and the greatest commandment? Uh, And it's a good question. And the reason that I can say with pretty good assurance that he was humble and sincere is because if you go on to read verses 32 through 34, you see that he praises Jesus. He has a favorable opinion of Jesus, and uh, Jesus has some good things to say about him. So why would you ask a question like this, what's the greatest of all the commandments? Well, you can understand why there would be some confusion because in the first five books of the English Bible, what we know as the Pentateuch, there are 613 laws. 248 of those laws are positive, meaning these are laws that tell you you need to do something. And the other 365 of those are negative which are saying these are things that are forbidden, these are things you shouldn't do. So when you're faced with 613 laws, you have this question, what am I supposed to do? I mean, which is the best one of all? What, do I, what really would sum it all up? What would be the bottom line? What do I need to do to be pleasing to God? And Jesus sums it all up by giving two great statements of truth, and then he boils all of the teaching of the prophets down to one word, and that one word is love. And we all like that word, but we don't always know how to practice that. We don't always know how to live that out. So what did Jesus say? How did he answer them? Well, first of all, Jesus said to him that you need to love God completely. In verses 29 and 30, Jesus begins with a statement of faith. Not a command, but a statement. And it's a statement that all Jewish people knew well. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
that was known to everybody listening as the Shema. It is the first passage that a Jewish child learns to memorize or memorizes. It's a passage found in the mezuzah, which is hung on the doorpost of every Jewish home. It is quoted every day at prayer time by the Jews. It's a reminder that there is no God but Yahweh, Jehovah God, and that anything that occurs first place in a person's life is an idol, is a false god, and we know from Deuteronomy chapter 6 that that's not a good thing because we are to have no other god but Yahweh, Jehovah, the one true God. That's a good place to start. So he starts with a statement. And as he tells them how we should love the Lord, it's obvious that he's illustrating that love in a way that shows that the love for God that we have should consume our entire being. It should be what we think about when we sit down, when we get up, when we lie down. It should be what we're all about. We love Him with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength. So the first and the greatest commandment deals with one's relationship with God. What is your relationship with God like? And I'm not talking about have you made a profession of faith? Have you been through the waters of baptism? And that's important. But after you've done that, what is your relationship with God like? Do you love God the way you should love God? don't love God the way you should love God? Are you willing to love God the way you should love God? And are you willing to tell him, God, I just don't feel like I love you the way I should love you, and I'm asking you to make me willing if I'm not willing, and Lord, to take my life and do things in my life to draw me into a deeper and closer personal intimate relationship with you. So Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, that is, with your thinking and with your affection. Not necessarily here when we think of heart, thinking of the seat of the emotions, but possibly he's saying, love God without pretense. Let your love for God be genuine. Do you really love God or are you just pretending to love God? I mean, these are deep questions that ought to keep us awake at night. Do I love God, or am I just going through the motions? Do I say I love Him, and then I act like He doesn't even exist? I've shared the story before of the mother who had taught her children all about faith and trusting God and believing in God. And there was a crisis that came in the family, and she was wringing her hands, and she was crying, and she was all upset, and her little preschool child came and crawled into her lap and said mommy what's wrong and she said oh mommy's just worried and uh, you know we got all these problems and the little child stroked mama's hair and said mama don't worry about it let's just pray God will take care of it she taught the child well but as happens so often in our lives we forget what we taught we don't practice what we preached and we need to love God in our thinking Do we care more for ourselves and our comfort than we do for Him and for what He says? So love God with all your heart. Then He says love God with all your soul, that is your desires and your feelings. Do you have a desire for God? Is that a predominant part of your life? Man, I want to be around God's people. I want to be with God. These are our emotions. Our inmost being is so touched by God that We think of Him. We sing to Him. We love to hear about Him. We love Him with all of our emotional being. We love to hear about Him. We love to talk about Him. We find ourselves thinking about Him and singing about Him and singing to Him when we're alone. We used to know a couple years and years ago, and the man and woman obviously loved each other dearly. They'd been married for years And so often the wife would ask the husband, do you love me? And his response to her was, I come home to you, don't I? (laughs) Well, she knew that that was a joke. She knew how he felt about her. He did that because he'd said that sometime before and she got a kick out of it. So that was always his response. I come home to you, don't I? 
But what if that was really the way we felt? Come home to you, don't I? Or what if it was, I want to be home with you. I love being home with you. I'm acting like I want to be home with you. I don't want to go anywhere else. I just want to be here in your beauty, darling. <laughs> just, just, just us. That's the way it should be with God. I don't have to go to church and be with God's people. I get to go to church. And so somebody says, well, I don't have to go to church. I don't either. I get to go to church. I don't have to read my Bible. I don't either. I get to read my Bible. If you love God with all your soul, you can't wait to get into His presence because it's going to be so good. Why do you think the enemy tries to keep us away from the things of God? Isn't it interesting that when you get serious and want to read this book, the phone hasn't rung all day long or rang or rings or whatever. I'm not even going to try to get, get that right. And it does. Or you get a text. Or you remember that there's dishes in the dishwasher and the dishwasher needs to be unloaded. Or you remember that there's laundry in, in the, uh, the washing machine. Or you remember that there was something you forgot at the store just when you're getting ready to spend time with God. Do you think that comes from the Spirit? Or do you think there are elements at work in the world, we might call them demons, who are paying attention to how serious you're getting and it is a threat to them because when you get on your knees or you get into the Word, you have just connected to the power source. And the devil doesn't like that. So he's got to keep you distracted, even with good things. Distracted. I think Baptists are the most distracted people in the world. We can find more to do at the church that can keep us away from spending intimate time with God. So we got to work on that and spend more time with Him and make sure that more of the stuff we do here is about Him and not about everything else. The third thing, he says, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, that is your understanding. This involves the intellect. So we consider Him, His teachings. We meditate on what He has given us in His Word. We grapple with those things. We come to a conscious decision that even though we may not understand it all, we are going to follow Him. We're going to seek to live it out. We're going to ask for clarification. We have to decide for ourselves, not because somebody else told us to believe it, but because we know it to be true in our hearts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is your energy and your power, your physical being. Loving Him is not just in word alone, but in expression of the physical body. And you say, well, you know, that sounds good, but how do you know what's in a person's heart? You know, you see all these people out here, and they look good. And they come to church. and How do you know if they're where they need to be? Well, I really don't know your heart, and you don't know mine. But the Bible does tell us in Luke 6, 45, that out of the mouth, the heart speaks. So our words betray us. They tell on us. When we speak doubt and we speak fear, we're showing that our faith is weak. Our actions tell on us. You can watch a husband and wife and you can tell if they love each other or not if you pay close attention to them. You can tell if somebody loves God. He is talking here, just to sum it up, the bottom line about being consumed in our entire being. Jesus met a man, and it's recorded in Mark chapter 10, who ran to Jesus and asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied to him, you know the commandments? And the man said, yes, I've kept every one of them. And Jesus looked at him and loved him, the Bible says. And it was very understandable to Jesus that this man had divided loyalties. And so Jesus said to him, well, there's one thing you lack. Take everything you have and sell it and give the money to the poor and come back and follow me. And the Bible says that the man went away sorrowful. He couldn't give up his stuff. 
because he was consumed with his stuff and he loved his stuff more than he loved Jesus. Jesus is not talking here about a works salvation, but the man's reaction and the man's response showed his heart. Even though he thought he'd kept all the Ten Commandments, in his heart he was far from God and he wasn't able to give up in order to follow. You know, if we could grasp what Jesus says here just in this first part, a great revival would take place. The second thing we see in this passage in verse 31 is that we ought to love others fully. We ought to love other people. The man didn't ask for the second thing that Jesus said, but Jesus quotes to him from Leviticus 19.18 that we love our neighbor as we do ourselves. You know, if you love God the way you should, loving your neighbor is just an outgrowth of that. Because you can't be in love with God and hate your neighbor. The Bible's very clear on that. I'll share that passage with you in a moment. But if you love God and you are in intimate connection and fellowship with God, it overflows into the life of everybody around you. They can see that you love God. The reason for that is because God is love and you can't have a connection with God without that love flowing through you. And He loved the world so much that He gave His Son and He gives us eternal life. And because He loved us so much, we want that for other people. In Luke 10, 29, Jesus went on to describe to them who their neighbors were. That even included those enemies that they hated. So I find that a lot of times I have a lot of work to do in this area of my life. I don't always love others as I love myself. And what does that mean anyway, as you love yourself? We're to love others with the same love we pour out upon ourselves. That is, we look out for their best interest. If somebody comes and tells me a very salacious story about somebody else, I want to protect that person if I love them. I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. I don't want to go spread that <clears throat> because I don't know, first of all, if it's true. And if it is true, I want to save that person from humiliation because I love them. I would want that in my life. I, I want to look out for my best interest. And I hate to say this, but I've watched human nature through the years. And if I made a mistake and messed up, I don't really expect any grace and mercy from anybody seen so many people mess up and we kick them to the curb and we don't want anything to do with them and we exclude them from the fellowship. But God doesn't do that to us, does he? He says, if you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And he picks us up and he cleans us off. And he says, you can be restored and you can be useful in my kingdom. As dirty as you've been, you're clean now. And I want to treat other people that way, but I don't always do that, and neither do you. We have their welfare at heart. We have their good at heart. And we can get cynical, but we have to come back to this. Just as quick as we are to forgive ourselves, we need to forgive others. Now, I say that usually because there are a lot of people who have a very hard time forgiving themselves. We're quick to find a way to be at peace. You hear people all the time saying, I'm just looking for peace and quiet. We want other people to be at peace. We're quick to desire the best for ourselves Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so just one example there, I think about gossip. Don't believe everything you hear. And if you hear it, go to the source and ask a question. You know, it's gotten so bad that <laughs> I take screenshots sometimes of my text messages because my phone erases them after 30 days. And I just feel like sometime I'm going to have to prove myself to show that we had this conversation. Because people are liars. They are. You know it's the truth. And it's a shame that we have to live that way. But you have to ask yourself the question when you hear gossip, would I want people talking about me that way? Probably not. It's none of our business what other people think about us or what they say about us, but we probably wouldn't want them talking about us 
the way we sometimes allow people to talk about them or the way we talk about them. So love others. New Testament's pretty clear on this. Here's three big passages. Listen to this. 1 John 4.20 If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? Ephesians 4.32 Be kind to one another, tenderhearted too, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Romans 13.10 Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Several years ago, I read about a former soldier who was born in Afghanistan who went back to rescue Christians and other people. He didn't have to. It was not part of his military requirement, but he did it because he loved the people there and he was able to get even members of his own family to safety because he loved them. And I've shared with you before the story of Brennan Manning who was a recovering alcoholic, who had been a Catholic priest. And his book, The Ragamuffin Gospel, if you've never read it, is a powerful book about God's love for us, even as nasty and dirty and sin-stained as we are. And Brennan Manning told the story of his friend in, I think it was the Korean War, and they had grown up together and they loved each other. They had a great relationship. And there was a grenade. They were laughing about growing up in the fox and all of a sudden a grenade is thrown in a foxhole. His friend was eating a chocolate bar. He threw the chocolate bar down in just a split second, looked at Brennan, smiled, and fell down on the grenade and took the impact so that Brennan would live. And Brennan later asked the man's mother, do you th- I think his name was Ray, do you think Ray loved me? And in a very angry tone, I can understand, she said, my God, what more could he have done for you? He gave life for you. Do we love other people that much? Is there anybody in your life that you love that much that you'd be willing to give your life for them? Or at least give up gossiping about them? Or give up mistreating them? Or give up whatever it is that you're doing that's not loving toward them? The third thing here... is that, very quickly, loving God and others costs. There is a cost to love. After we come to Christ as Savior, it's only then that it's possible for us to truly love God and others because you can't love God with an unforgiven heart. You can't love God with a lost heart. Before that, we're not even looking for God. Romans 3.11 says, No one understands, no one's seeking God. And that Coming to Him and that loving Him is going to cost you something. There's no such thing as Christianity without a cost. Now, salvation is by grace through faith. We don't earn our salvation. I'm not talking about that. But once you come to know Christ as your Savior, it will cost you something. You're going to have to say no to some things. You're going to have to say yes to some things. You're going to have some people say no to you because you follow Christ. You're no longer going to live to please yourself. There's going to be things that you'll have to die to in your life. When you say yes to one thing, you say no to something else. And that's true in marriage, isn't it? Your life the day before you slip on that ring is a lot different than after you put it on. You may have to sing on your wedding day to all the girls I've loved before. Because you're not supposed to be loving them after you slip that wedding band on and take those vows. Married love, true love, has to say no to some people and to some things. And has to say yes to some things that he never thought he'd have to say yes to before or she never thought she'd have to say yes to before, has to put up with some things that they never thought they'd have to put up with because they love each other. And love is patient. And love endures. Jesus will be first. And sadly, we don't see that much anymore. Loving other people and loving God costs me 
It may cost me financially. It'll cost me my energy. It'll cost me my gifts. It'll cost me time. It'll call, the cost will be my getting involved because I love God so much. What did love cost Jesus? Well, he died on a cross. And we could go through the whole detailed situation, but you've been in church long enough, you've been Good Friday and Easter long enough to know what that entails. What if Jesus loved us the way we love him? What if he was as faithful to us as we are to him? Loving God and loving others. Mm -hmm.